1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we've started a section that we began last week talking about head coverings, and thank the Lord I only spent one Sunday on that, talking about an orderliness in worship. And so we continue to examine a proper or orderliness in the way that we conduct ourselves before the Lord. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. In honor of the word of the king, would everyone please stand? 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 17. The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you might be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Let us pray. Our Lord, as we consider this passage this morning, in light of coming to this table to eat in remembrance of the broken body of our Lord and the spilled blood for our sins, I pray that you search our hearts. For Jesus said to the churches in Revelation, I am he who searches heart and mind. And you examine us and find us worthy before you, not because of anything that we have done, but because we've been washed white, we've put on new robes that have been given to us by the Savior, purifying ourselves before the Father, so that in the way that we come to this table and fellowship with our Lord and fellowship with the people of God, we do so in a manner that is righteous and is worthy before God. But if there be any sinful way in us, Lord, I pray we would be convicted of that. That anyone here would not be so tempted to take of the bread and drink of the cup if it would bring judgment upon them. But in reverence, in holy fear of the God who saves, but also the God who judges, would they partake in this sacrifice in a praiseworthy manner, in a manner that gives honor and glory to you. For as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we strive for righteousness through our Savior Christ. It is in his name that we pray, and all God's people said, amen. 
Thank you. You may be seated. So this is a rare privilege this morning, and it's, it's by the providence of God that all of these things have lined up the way that they have. Being able to start today with baptism, being able to end service today with the Lord's Supper, and be able to preach today on this ordinance that has been given to us by our Savior Christ. And in fact, we will not be preaching on this subject just today, but all July. We will be in this section in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 through 34. What we are going to do today is go over this uh, as kind of an overview. We're going to look at an outline of everything that Paul is laying out before the Corinthians. We will dissect it in its entirety. And then over the next few weeks after this, we'll go through it bit by bit, piece by piece, examining the finer details, not just in what Paul commissions the Corinthians in, but what we understand as the Lord's table as an ordinance. So we will be uh, looking at Passover in the book of Exodus, for that is where the Lord's Supper first began. We will look at the ordinance as Christ gave it to his disciples in the Gospels, And then we will look again to see how this pertains to a regular practice in a fellowship in the body of Christ. You can tell before we even get started this morning, this being our first Sunday without a nursery, as we have a lot more babies crying in this service, I think it is a beautiful sound. And please do not think that you will get any judgment or frustration from your pastor up here at the pulpit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, We have the Lord's table that is presented as a wonderful fellowship to be partaken in by the body of Christ. And we partake in regular meals as a family. And I'm talking specifically about me, my wife, my kids at home gathering around the table. And we make it a point that as much as we possibly can be around the table together for food, eating together. Now, sometimes since we've had an infant in the home the last, oh, almost half a year now, Uh, She eats when she wants. We have her on a schedule, but sometimes she's not going to allow mom to come to the table to eat with the rest of us. Uh, So so sometimes we're a little bit broken together at the uh, at the dinner table. But nonetheless, there are there is a great relationship as a family that is forged there at the table. And I think that, you know, this as Christian families, I think that as as a regular part of fellowship, we try to gather together at the table, and break bread together. Talk about our day. Usually it's dinner time that we're all around the table together. But this is something the benefits of are not just shared and appreciated by those who are in Christian or conservative households, but also by those in a secular society who are beginning to see the benefits of gathering around the table to eat. Some of you may have grown up in homes or in a culture or society in which family time was with the TV tray out in front of you in front of the television and watching TV as you eat. But now even secular therapists are looking at that time around the dinner table as being more beneficial than family time around the television. As a matter of fact, there was an article in the Washington Post in which the therapist who wrote the article said, as a family therapist, I often have the impulse to tell families to go home and have dinner together rather than spending an hour in counseling with me. And then she provides three convincing reasons why families need to make time around the table every night of the week if possible. Number one, brain food. Kids learn more vocabulary from time around the table than reading books or having their parents read to them aloud. A third reason, healthy food. Kids consume more fruits and vegetables when eating around the table as a family and are less likely to be obese in their later years. By contrast, families that eat around the TV tend to put on more pounds than those who eat around the dinner table. Uh, You know, this this thing of kids are more likely to eat their fruits and vegetables when you're together as a family. Uh, My wife has given me a look. Where is that happening in our kids? We don't... I've not seen evidence of that scientific data in our house yet. I don't know that one. Anyway, and then a third reason that she gives is soul food. So we have brain food, healthy food, soul food. Teens from families that regularly eat around the table are less likely to develop high-risk behavior, 
In other words, abusing substances like tobacco and alcohol. They're all, they also show fewer signs of stress or depression, and kids who are bullied at school are more likely to bounce back when they've forged strong family bonds at the dinner table. So these are the three reasons that she gives as to why families should make it a regular practice of eating around the table. I would say that one reason that she did not give that we as Christians understand is spiritual food. So we got the brain food, healthy food, soul food thing. You can have all the scientific data that backs that up, but we understand the concept of spiritual food and that it's around the dinner table that we talk about spiritual things. Ask about how your day went, how can I pray for you? What does the Bible have to say about that? Or we even break out the family Bible and open up the pages and read the scriptures aloud and talk about what the Lord is telling us in his holy word. As a family, our individual devotional times happen in the morning. So I have my own devotional time. My wife has hers. The kids will memorize their Awana verses or they will have an assignment that they need to do. And then it's in the evening when we gather together as a family around the table that we open up the Bible together and pray together and talk about the scriptures. So there's a spiritual food aspect to this as well. So here are the benefits of eating together as a family around the dinner table. When Becky and I were in Florida uh, back in April and May, spent some vacation time down there, one of the families that we met had this ambition to begin a ministry which they called FEAST. And FEAST stands for Families Eat at the Same Time or Families Eat at the Same Table. They hadn't quite figured out how they want to use that T in the, in the FEAST acronym yet. But basically, the, in the ministry, the wife wanted to make entire meals and either have them frozen or she would even have one that she would make fresh that day. And a family would arrange with her in advance to come and pick up that meal and take it home. And all they would have to do is dish it out on the plates and have a hot meal together as a family. Or if it was something that was frozen, pop it in the oven, cook it and get it out, serve it on the plates, and then everybody can eat together as a family. Eliminating that step in the process of making a meal because how busy are we as Americans these days? Mom and dad both work. The kids are in school. They're in extracurricular activities. So as soon as school gets done, they're at volleyball practice or football practice or whatever. And then they get home and everybody's just too exhausted. So you're making a sandwich and you're eating it in front of the television instead of having a meal together as a family. So we thought, hey, it's a great idea as a ministry to encourage families to eat around the table together even more. As a body of Christ, as the family of God, we also gather around the table together to eat. And I'm not just talking about potluck. That's what we do as Baptists. That's a different thing. But we as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, with God as our Father, with Christ as our elder brother, as described in Colossians and in Hebrews, we have a table that we gather together around, and that is the table of the Lord. Where when we partake in this bread and drink of this cup, we remember the sacrifice of our God that was needed to pay for our sins. And when we gather together at this table, we have a rectangular table up here where the elements are served from but think of it like King Arthur's round table. It, when, you, when you read the legend of King Arthur's round table, why was his table round? It was because when he and his knights sat at that table, everyone there was equal. There was no one at a head of a table. There was no one at the foot of the table. There was no one who was lesser than. But everybody at that table was equal. And so it is the same with us. When we come to the Lord's table and we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are equal at this table. There is nobody who is greater than anyone else. No one is stronger or weaker. No one is rich or poor. We are all wealthy inheritance of the kingdom of God. And in remembrance of that gift that has been given to us through Jesus Christ our Lord, we eat of this bread and drink of this cup. This is the table that we gather around. And we share spiritual food. But in Corinth, when they gathered around this table, they were not equal. There was division. There was class separation that was going on in Corinth. You could apply this to 
racism, to prejudice, bigotry. It even applies to class separation. Though they may have all been the same skin color, there were those that saw themselves as more important than others because they had a higher social standing or made, made more money. And so they would eat first and they would gorge themselves and fill them up on the food, fill themselves up. Whereas those who were poor would get there, they were lucky to get anything if there was anything left. Now, the, the dinner that we're talking about is not like the Lord's, say, uh, Lord's table that we're participating in here. We've got bread and we've got juice. Who on earth in their right mind would pick up that plate and just dump the whole thing in their mouth? I mean, why would somebody gorge themselves on just bread and a cup? But this was an agape feast. When you read the history in the church of Corinth, they would participate in this huge feast called an agape feast. Agape in Greek translates as love. It was a love feast. And so they had just just massive tables just full of food. So whenever they would get together and remember the sacrifice of our Lord, they're chowing down. And whoever was rich and brought the most food, they would eat the most food. And whoever was poor, well, they had to wait their turn. And hey, good luck to you if there was anything left when you got there. And you knew who the rich families were and you knew who the poor families were because the rich ones are the ones that are stuffing their faces. And the poor ones are the ones that are off to the side waiting for a chance to eat. And Paul is saying, this is not the way this is supposed to be. Which is why when we get to this section in verse 17, he starts off by saying, in the following instructions, I don't commend you. How did we start chapter 11? In verse 2, when he was talking about head coverings and orderliness in worship, he says, I commend you because... You remember me in everything and maintain the traditions that I delivered to you. So in this, I commend you. There is an orderliness in the structure of your worship. There are some traditions that have been given to you that you do properly practice. But when it comes to the way that you participate in the Lord's table, I can't give you any commendation for that. In fact, Paul has to rebuke them for the way that they're behaving because they have been misusing the uh, the table to a degree that some of them have even been getting sick and dying, is what we read about in verse 30. So we have this particular section which we are going to use as the launching point to understand better what this table signifies and how we partake in it in a proper way. And this is what we're going to be talking about for the entire month of July. And so we have this section, verses 17 through 34, broken down in three ways. From verses 17 to 22, Paul confronts the problem. Verses 23 through 26, he gives the practice. Verses 27 through 32, he discusses the penalties And then, in the last two verses, 33 and 34, he makes a final petition. So we have problem, practice, penalties, and petition. And that's how we're going to break this up and look at it this morning. So Paul begins, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. It's as though Paul is saying, it would have been better for you to not even try to do this table on Sunday morning than to do it the way that you're doing it. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. For me, that is one of the most blessed verses in all of Scripture. There must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. In other words, we as a body are going to disagree. We are not always going to think alike on every issue. Now, there are some tertiary issues that we will differ on, but the essentials we all must be alike on. And brother, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're Presbyterian in practice, right? Okay, so a Presbyterian joining us today for service. How can he partake in the Lord's table with us when we differ on certain covenantal practices and beliefs? Because we believe the main thing is the main thing. 
and on those essential doctrines that have been given to us concerning the faith. We are brothers, we are believers together in the faith, and and sister, brother and sister, I don't mean to exclude you. (laughs) We are together in like body, in like mind with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We differ on some of the secondary issues, but we are alike on the essential issues. Why is it do we not participate with the community gathering, the ecumenical service that they have yearly right around July 4th down in the park here in Junction City. Why don't we participate with that anymore? Because we differ on the essential things. Because there are some essential things that they believe in our teaching among the pastors in that group that we do not believe and we would say are even heretical. They would lead a person away from saving faith instead of to saving faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So these essential things we all have alike and in common. It's what makes us the body of Christ. It's what makes us brothers and sisters. But then you have different denominations. Well, denominations are separated out by secondary issues. We might disagree on secondary things, like, for example, how the Lord's Supper should be administered in practice. Who is allowed to partake in the Lord's Supper? How baptism is administered in practice. We believe in baptism, we just practice it a different way. So these are some secondary matters. They are all important, and as a church we practice them, but we just differ on our opinions and how those things should be practiced. I promise you, if you go into any Orthodox Baptist church or any Orthodox Presbyterian church, and you listen to the teaching, it will be the same. But there will be some things in practice that will differ, and that's why we have different denominations. So we differ on the secondary things, and we will have different churches. And then there are tertiary issues. Tertiary means third tier. It means that they are not as significant to divide us uh, into different denominations in terms of practice, but those tertiary issues will be the different opinions that we hold as individual members of the body of Christ. And if we were to take this microphone here and pass it around everybody, we would find that every single person in here holds some different opinions about some of the things concerning Scripture as every other person in here has. I, as a pastor, I learn from many different pastors. Probably my favorite pastor to listen to is Vody Bauckham. I love listening to Albert Moeller and John MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and Mark Dever. These are some of the men that have guided me in principle and practice in concerning the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But I will tell you this, that even among those five teachers that I just mentioned to you, there is not one of those five who are more decorated and learned men than I am. But there's not one of those five that I agree with on every single thing that they teach. Now, you might might hear me say that and go, Brother Gabe, that's that's pretty arrogant. To think that you might know something better than those guys know who all have their doctorates and teach at at big seminaries and schools and have been churning out disciples for years and years, and yet you think there might be some interpretation in Scripture that you would hold dearer than they might have a, a correct understanding of? Well, let me tell you this. If we were to give them the microphone and they were to come up here and say, they would say the exact same thing that there is not one teacher that they have listened to over the course of their ministry over the years that they agreed with on every single principle that they taught according to what the scriptures teach. There are some tertiary issues that we are going to disagree on. And what makes this verse so blessed is that we still are a body of Christ. We're still one body and in one mind when we show that we have those disagreements and we love each other anyway. There must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine would be recognized. Who are the disingenuous ones? The ones who cannot agree with your disagreement and say, you know what? Sorry, can't do this with you and leave the church. When they become divided over such tertiary issues, then we recognize that they were not really of us, as John talks about in 1 John 2.19. So Paul lays that principle out here as well. There are factions among you that in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. But those are not the factions that Paul is addressing here. Paul is addressing a matter that is way more essential. And that is that at this table there is unity. 
We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And as that hymn, they will know that we are Christians, continues, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know that we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know that we are Christians by our love. And if we're divided when we come to this table, then we bring reproach to the table. And we misalign the gospel that has been spoken to make one body of men from all nations. So Paul says in verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you're eating. These agape feasts that you're doing, that's not the Lord's table. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. And then one goes hungry. And then another gets drunk. So somebody is gorging themselves on their food and on the wine. And then we have this expression in verse 22. What? It's not a question. What with an exclamation mark? What's the matter with you? That's what Paul is saying. It's, re- it's rhetorical. He doesn't want an answer. They've got a serious problem. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Go there. Go there and eat all your food and drink all your drink. Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Now, there may be some, if Paul was standing face to face with them and asked that question, he said, no, no, brother Paul, we don't mean to do that. That may not be your intention, but that is what you're doing. When you're stuffing your own face but leaving others off to the side, you are bringing humiliation to those who have nothing. We know who they are. We know they don't have as much. And they stand over there looking humiliated because they cannot be with this other clique of people who are just more important because they have more. What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So here in these verses, 17 through 22, Paul has addressed the problem. And then next in verses 23 through 26, he gives us the proper practice of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. So as he goes on to describe the Lord's Supper here, he's saying, what I am telling you comes from God. This isn't Paul's way to practice the Lord's Supper. This is what the Lord commissioned us to do when he sat with his disciples and broke bread and passed the cup. This is what the Lord has said we do. And so here is the instruction that you have from the Lord. I received this instruction. I've given it to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, so this was Thursday night over the course of what we have come to know as Holy Week, He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, there are some beliefs and practices out there that take that literally. The Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church both see, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, as Jesus saying, this is literally my body. And so the Roman Catholics practice that at the moment of consecration, when the priest prays and that Eucharist is broken, it has become the literal body of Christ. And the cup has become his literal, actual blood. And the Orthodox believe the same. Now, there are three problems with this. And the first of which is, It should be obvious. If this is the actual body of Christ, then we've become cannibals. And Christ has actually made us cannibals by eating of his actual flesh and drinking of his actual blood. The second problem with this is eschatological. What do I mean by that? Well, eschatology is the study of end times. It is the study of last things. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said that if someone ever says to you, Look, there he is in the inner rooms, or here he is in the wilderness. Do not go to them, for Christ will not return in such a way. He says, as far as the lightning can be seen from the east to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
His return will be announced and seen by the whole world. There will be no mistaking when Christ is returned. Yet the Catholics and the Orthodox practice that he returns in some kind of mitigated form in the Eucharist and in the cup. And Jesus has blatantly said in Matthew 24, do not go to them. And the third problem that this doctrine of transubstantiation, as it is called by the Roman Catholic Church, a third problem that this creates is it is the re-sacrifice of Jesus Christ, where we have in Romans and in Hebrews, it said that Christ offered himself once for all, and in Hebrews it says he will never be sacrificed again. But in the Roman Catholic practice of communion, Christ is re-sacrificed. Now, I said that one time and had a Roman Catholic tell me, no, you are misrepresenting the doctrine of transubstantiation. I took them to the Roman Catholic catechism where it actually says in their catechism, this is the re-sacrificing, the re-offering of Christ's body. That is directly contradictory to what it says in the scriptures. And so this is not the way that we practice the Lord's table, not with this literal giving of of. Christ's body and the drinking of his blood. But these things are symbolic. And when the disciples received that bread that Jesus was giving to his disciples and the cup that he passed to them and he said, this is my body that is being broken for you, they didn't have some understanding of this being his actual body. In fact, they were rather confused. Jesus said to them, you do not understand what I am doing for you now, but soon you will understand it. He said that even when he was washing their feet after they had partaken in this meal. His body had yet to be broken and his blood had yet to be spilled on the cross, which would happen the next day when he broke this bread and gave them this cup. So it could not have been his literal body and his literal blood. That sacrifice had not been offered yet. But he gave them Passover with new meaning a new purpose, a new remembrance. Verse 25, in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is a continued remembrance. It is It is not just a remembrance. It is is engraved on the table in front of you here. Do this in remembrance of me. But according to Paul here in verse 26, it's not just remembrance. It's also preaching. We partake in this table to proclaim that Christ's body was offered for our sins. And we'll continue to proclaim that until the day that he returns. The judgment of the Lord is coming against all those who do unrighteousness. And it is only by Christ that we will be saved from that day of judgment. That day for those who are in Christ will be a day of great rejoicing. But as Zechariah says, those who do not know Christ, it will be a day of wrath. And so it is by this broken body of Christ that our sins have been covered, atoned for. And it is only in Christ that we are saved. And that's what the word means when we use it. Saved. Doesn't just mean you go to heaven. It means you're saved from the wrath of God. And we have received his righteousness, clothed in white robes. Verse 27. Verses 27 through 32 now, we have the penalties. So we've been given the problem. Paul gives the proper practice, and then he says to them, well, here's the penalties that have been laid upon you because you have not been practicing this in a proper way. Verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. You might consider then the way that Paul words this is when a person partakes In communion, in an unworthy way, they have not aligned themselves with Christ, who is crucified. They have aligned themselves with those who are doing the crucifying. That was exactly who Peter confronted at Pentecost in Acts 2. Jesus was given up, Peter said, by the foreknowledge and perfect plan of God. But you who crucified him 
are guilty of his death. And they were cut to the heart by the words of Peter and said, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will be saved. So those who eat the bread or drink of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner are not with the Lord at this table. They are rather outside the upper room. Those who are of the mob, those who are of the Romans, those who are of the Jews who said crucify him and will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So Paul says, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Once you've been examined, once you see in the inner self that has been purified by Christ, that strives for sanctification to grow in holiness, to be more and more like our Savior. Once you have been examined, so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And understand me clearly in that commission that it is more honorable for you to eat than it is for you not to eat. Do you understand what I mean by that? So there are some who are going to think of themselves as more pious. They're going to think of themselves as more holy than somebody else because I didn't eat of the bread and drink of the cup. See, I, I see that I'm an imperfect man. Oh, unworthy am I. So I am not going to eat of the bread or drink of the cup so that you can see how much more self-examining I am than you are. And if that is the intention in their heart, they must take that up with the Lord. I tell you that we, from the outside, cannot look at a person who does not partake and make that judgment of them. We can't do that. A person may have a legitimate reason why they know they would be partaking in this table in an unworthy manner if they were to come to this table. But let nobody withdraw themselves from this table for reasons of piety for thinking that it is better for them not to eat than to eat. For Paul says, let a person examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That's what we should aspire for, being able to come to this table and eat and drink. Verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So examine yourself then come to the table, but if you have not examined yourself and there is still sin in you that you have not confessed before God, if there is enmity between you and your brother, you think of what Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, that if you have anything against your brother or your brother has anything against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and make peace with your brother first. Then come back and offer your sacrifice. And so we apply that to the Lord's table. If there is division between you and anyone else in this body, I would encourage you, make it right. You know, it's a common practice in the church today to do what's, what's called an altar call. So at the end of service, somebody stands forward and says, hey, if anybody wants to give their life to Christ, come forward and do that now. What I've not seen a pastor do is stand in front of his congregation before communion, stand in front of that table and do what's called guarding the table and saying, if anybody has something against their brother right now, go and make peace with your brother and then come to this table. Why don't pastors do that? Because that's a lot less friendly. That doesn't get style points from your congregation as saying, hey, come forward and get saved, punch your get out of hell free card right now. But do we have a desire to present this table in a proper way. So much so that we understand the unity that needs to be within us, within our spirits toward those who are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we desire unity at this table so much that I'm going to go take care of the problem that I have with my brother or sister first before I partake in the bread and the cup. I must tell you, if there's strife in your marriage, don't partake of this bread and this cup. For Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7, that if there is strife between a husband and a wife, your prayers are hindered before God. So, off, so also would be your proclaiming of this sacrifice if you came to this table. Make things right with your spouse. As we regularly practice the Lord's table the first Sunday of every month, perhaps that could be a remembrance to you on Saturday night before that first Sunday to go, boy, I got something against my wife I've been holding on to for a couple of weeks. I better make this right. You should have been doing that anyway. 
but maybe the table would commission you all the more to do that. Now, I'll say in this month, in the month of July, we'll be partaking in the table twice. We won't do this down at the park on August 6th when we have our service. But since there are five Sundays in July, so we'll have communion this Sunday and also the last Sunday in July when we finish up this series and come once again to this chapter and talk about proper practice at the Lord's table. So Paul goes on and says, talking about eating and drinking judgment on himself. In verse 30, he says, that is why... Many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. So consider that. There are some in the church in Corinth who have been judged to the degree that they've gotten sick and died because they partook in this in an improper way. Now, as I've said before, we're going to come back to these things again and talk about them at greater length. So we'll talk about this again at another time. But understand that the judgment of the Lord is still practiced in this way. John says in 1 John chapter 5, that if there is anyone who is guilty of a sin that does not lead to death, let him repent. But there is sin that leads to death. What does that mean? It means that there is a sin that a person can commit to a degree that God finally goes, you know what? You're done. And cuts off that person's life because they refuse to repent. And so we must know that the Lord still judges in such ways. And that the fear of the Lord would be upon us that we would partake in this table in a right way and not a way that would incur judgment. Paul says in verse 31, if we had judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. In other words, if we as the body of Christ had been encouraging and admonishing one another according to the word of God as we've been instructed to do, then our whole body would not come under judgment over misuse of this table because we had been sure to confront one another first in their sins before they had partaken in this table in an improper way. So we as the body of Christ have a duty and an obligation as brothers and sisters to check one another's sin and not to do this in such a way as though to lord yourself over somebody else or say, I know better than you, but out of love and care for that person. I would not want you to sin. And you have been walking in unrighteousness. And so bring them to correction that they once again would be on the path of righteousness and in step with Christ and his body. So we are disciplined by the Lord according to what he says in his words so that we may not be condemned along with the rest of the world. All the world is going to be judged on the day of judgment. But those who are in Christ are not going to be condemned. Romans 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So let us aspire to have the mind of Christ. And finally, we have the petition. We've been given the problem, the practice. Paul goes through the penalties that have been incurred upon the Corinthians because they improperly practice the Lord's table. And then he makes a final petition in verses 33 and 34. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, Wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. If that's the reason why you're coming to the table, if it's because of a weakness in your flesh, go take care of that in your own house. This is spiritual food. This is a spiritual acknowledgement of a spiritual thing that was done of the highest order. That Christ, the only perfect man who ever lived, who lived the life we were supposed to live, but because of our sin, because of Adam's sin, because we were born into that sin, we could not. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And it was Christ who lived the perfect life we couldn't live and died the death we were supposed to die and took upon himself the wrath of God for our sins. As Paul will later say to the Corinthians in another letter in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Double imputation. On the cross, Christ took our sins upon himself and he gave us his righteousness. And so now we stand before God, holy and purified, those who are in Christ Jesus, justified, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When you come together to eat, wait for one another and show that sacrifice to each other, 
not trying to weasel, weasel your way, squirm your way, shove your way to the front of the line, but considering others' needs ahead of your own so that when you come together, it won't be in judgment. And then this last sentence that we have about other things, I will give you directions when I come. So I said before, I consider verse 19 one of the most blessed verses in Scripture. I consider one, uh, the end of verse 34 one of the most disappointing about other things, I will give you directions when I come. And me, when I sit down at the feet of the teacher, I'm going, no, Paul, what? What? What were the other things? I want to know the other things. <laughs> so may we always have an attitude of, of wanting to be at the feet of the teacher, of wanting to know more of Christ and desiring to be with him so much that we want to be filled with him. Jesus said in John chapter 6 that unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no, no share with me in the kingdom of God. And the disciples who were following him, which at that time was by the hundreds and possibly thousands, looked at one another and said, what are you talking about? And Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. And they were so confused by what he was teaching, this eating flesh and drinking blood. They said, this is such a hard teaching. Who can understand this? That they turned around and left. And Jesus looked at the 12 that remained and said, how about you? Are you going to desert me too? And Peter said, where else are we going to go, Lord? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. And so let us come all the more longingly to this table, desiring the salvation that has been given to us in Christ our Lord, desiring him so much that we would be filled by him. And what a blessed gift this is, that Jesus gave us something tangible to be able to hold and taste and drink and be reminded of this sacrifice and also the command to be filled and satisfied.